Today we're going to be focusing on how to create joints and make them movable. One of your projects is going to require you to create a joint that moves some similar to this. So how do you make this happen? That's what we're going to cover today. So we're going to do a mock-up of this particular object and we're going to we're going to tweak it so it actually works and looks and coordinates like it should. From there, the rest of your arbor press should be able to be moved easily. So, let me go ahead and stop this and flip over to individual components and show you how to assemble them and put the joints in place for it to actually operate. All right, so first things first, let's go ahead and change the appearances so we can easily identify these parts. Always working in uh, the basic materials isn't easy. So we want to make sure we can, uh, I've already got it set up for aluminum. So let's go ahead and drop in red anodized here, blue anodized here. And uh, let's see here, let's go ahead and choose plastic or we can choose paint. We'll just choose paint, glossy paint, and we'll throw a green paint on this one. Okay. So, now that we've got them colored, we're gonna have to put them in place, and that's where the joints and the assembly come in as part of this design tool. Right now, you notice that they are components, they're not bodies. Remember, bodies are what we develop components are what we have to change the bodies into to make them flexible for assembly purposes. So that's the concept here. We have to change them into, into components before we can actually utilize them. All right, so when I inserted these particular objects into this drawing, I moved them into these positions here, okay, as just this is a starting spot. From here, we're gonna have to uh, locate them and position them a little bit uh, more finite. So the first thing is let's work on the rack. So what we're going to do is we are going to create a joint on this rack, but we have to figure out where that joint should be. And so on the rack, I've got to think about, all right, so the rack is going to slide up and down in the slot. What if I were to connect the top portion of the slot, but maybe I, oh, I got to do the back side. Because if I work with the back side here in the front corner, that should work pretty well. So I'll pick the back side here. And notice the, the coin or the, the component here. Now I want this surface, but I want this top corner. So you got to be careful because you can get two different directions and we want those directions to match up consistently. So you can see that that object is now set up. However, it's not exactly in the orientation that we need. Uh, the angle says 180. Let's hit uh, 90 and see what happens here. So we type in 90. Is that in the right direction? So this is the top corner. We rotated it 90 degrees and it looks like it's okay. And that's exactly where we need it to be. And so the other aspect about this is that we just don't want it rigid. We want to be able to have this object move. So right now we, we did a rigid constraint. We connected two specific points. We have to click over in the motion and tell it it's not going to rotate. It's not going to be rigid. But we want it to be able to slide. Oh, that's not good. We don't want it to slide in that direction. So we got to look at the XYZ icon in the upper corner. We want it to slide in the Y direction. Liking that. You can animate it if you like it again. So you can see how it's going to move. So we have different motion controls. So this is way different than other tools. You're actually applying the constraint here at the corner, the, the location constraint. But then you're also applying a motion constraint associated with it. So you, you can control both movement and position all in one command. You don't have to have multiple commands to do that. We'll choose OK. All right, so now we got to deal with the spur gear. So the spur gear has got to fit in here. 
However, that could get a little tricky. So, same situation, we're going to have to create a joint. And the motion, I think, is going to be rigid initially. We'll deal with that. Um, but the position of this object, we're going to need to find the center point on this object here. All right, why are we not happy here? Let me cancel this and start this over. So we need to create a joint. And there we go. So now I want to create the center of this object on this face, the position of the joint. Now where is that located? Well, that's going to be located here. But you can see that there's a midpoint also. But if we know the offset distance, which we do from our drawing, we could pick this point, connect the spur gear, and then offset it. Because remember, not only can we move the object as part of this, but we can also control the positioning. So right now it's still got the sliding motion going because that's what we used last time. Theoretically, we're going to use Revolute here, but we're not sure where we're going yet. But I also need to position this. And so it's got to move in this direction. So I'm going to pick this arrow and I'm going to look at it from the front view because you can see that it's off. Now, Knowing from experience, it's going to be around a quarter inch, so 0.25, and that's pretty good. What if we did 0.24? That looks good too. That looks like right on the edge here that it's more or less centered in that space. And again, the drawing will give you the value. Okay, so we're right there at 0.24. Now the motion that we were looking at was rotating in the wrong direction. So what axis do we need to rotate around? Well, let's see. Is it the x-axis? No. Is it the z-axis? Yes. So we want the motion to be on the z-axis here. So now this object is rotating. May or may not be in the right direction. We're not worried about that. We have it positioned properly, and we have the rotation moving in the right direction. That's what we're focused on. So now we've got the two constraints associated with this. Now the third constraint that we have to put in here is called a translation constraint. And so this is actually now called a motion link. It's not a drive joint. We're actually, because we're not driving the joint to a specific position, we're actually going to create a motion link between our two objects. And so we have to pick the joints. So we're going to pick the rotation joint and the origin of the sliding joint. And when we look at it, this thing's cranking. Okay, this thing's spinning faster than the Twilight Zone clock. So we're going to have to control this, okay? And it's going to take a little bit of work, and we'll get there. It's going to be a trial and error scenario. So I'm going to first do this down to 90. Okay, so that slows it down. And the distance of 0.5. So let's try 45. Not bad. So we can stop it and restart it, and that's looking pretty good. Um, the distance here probably a little bit high. Let's go 0.75 and see what happens. Ooh, not good. So 0.5 was much better, so we'll go 0.4. Too fast. Okay, so you can see that it is there, there is a trial and error component, and what we're dealing with here is the distance of the slider moving, and the angle of this rotating. And so we have to get the rotation angle and the distance of the slider moving coordinated. Luckily, the motion is in the correct direction. If not, we'd have to use the reverse option. So we'll come back to this in just a second uh, overall. Uh, 
but we'll we'll continue to focus on trying to get this cleaned up. I think the other one, and I can pop back over to the other assembly movement and see how that turned out here in just a second to get the numbers that I created there. But you can see what we're trying to do. We're controlling the vertical motion and the horizontal or the rotational. But before we actually finalize this, there's a setting that I need to set in on this particular object. I need to edit this joint, but I need to edit the joint limits. And so the joint limit here for vertical and, and for vertical slide, I need to control. And so they're, we're going to set a minimum and a maximum position. Now the deal is, is that no matter what, the minimum must be smaller than the maximum. So if I put in 1.0 here, I have to put something smaller in the minimum. Whether it's 0, but it's got to be below 1. Then I can animate it. Okay, so I'm going to start the minimum at 0.25. So this is going to start at 0.25 up, again, gear teeth, and we'll go 2.5 total distance. 2.5 is too far, so we need to back that down to 2.0. 2.0, I think, is going to work. Let's animate. So the most it can move is between there and there. We could actually probably make this 0.20. And you can control this. As you can see, I'm bringing down the minimum. But remember, the minimum has to be smaller than the maximum. And the animation tells shows us how it's actually going to move. Now we'll choose OK. In our list here, and also in our bottom area, we can go back to the motion link and edit that particular feature. So now we can hit the animation and see how it works. All right, so if we did. 90 degrees and 0 0.50 a little bit less all right so let's flip over here to the assembly demo check and see what I had set up here so I had 60 degrees and 0.51 so let's set this up with the same way and see what happens. So 60 degrees and 0.51. Looking pretty sharp. It's actually moving in the right direction. So the key is I just need to get the starting and ending positions correct. So I might have to go back to either the rotation and find a new zero home or I can do the limits and so I'm going to go ahead and do the limit on the vertical and I think I set the limits here at 0.25 and I can go back to the other one but 0.25 set it and again I've got to try to match up um, let's see here if I suppress this and rotate that slightly and then unsuppress okay it's still matched up so you can see that the teeth are exactly matched up now we're gonna have to unmatch those teeth so that's kind of the scenario that uh, because then it goes back to where it was. So I'm going to have to work on controlling the exact position of, of the teeth. But the process is correct. And editing this feature and playing it, you can see that it is the correct angle and distance. So let me pause the video, figure out how to adjust it, and we'll come back and show you. Okay, as you can see, it's now repaired. So what was the magic that occurred for that to, to work? Well, if you remember, we had to go and we set the limit on 
the slide. And the slide allows us to move this up and down. And so going and setting the edit joint limit, I back that down to 0.125. And so you can control the starting position of that um, on each location. So if we back this down to say 0.09, too many points, you can see where it moved that vertical distance, so 0.10. may be more accurate. So you can see how I can move that vertical slide in between the, uh, the spur gear. Once I have that, I then can go back to the translation feature and then animate it. And you can see it's a little bit off a distance of 60 degrees and 0.51. I might need to go to 0.5 now. That's the wrong direction. Maybe 0.52. 0.52 looks a little bit better. Let's see what 0.53 looks like. A little bit too much. Maybe 0.525. So you can control the distance that it's moving, the slider moving in relationship to the angle movement of the spur gear. So that's how you control actionable movement for our project. Once you get this down, all the other components will connect and then this will be driven uh, by the movement, which will be amazing. Have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now.